So welcome to a, another issue with Great British Landscapes, or shall I call it On a Landscape Now? I think uh, you probably ought to. We're branded. Uh, <laughs> we've got David, Ward, David Ward's house now, and we're looking at uh, a few of his pictures and having a, a general chat. Hello. Hi, Tim. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, this, this picture you started on is one of, one of my personal favourites, and I saw this first when I was on a workshop with you and Richard Childs uh, on Harris. Oh, right, yeah, the Hebrides, uh, yeah. Got what got me into some of the qualities of the large format results. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Um, it was um, made in, um, in northern Arizona in, a, in a, um, a place called Poverty Flats, which is, is the title of the, of the shot. It's uh, quite a difficult place to reach. It's about 22 miles off a sand track. Um, and I really didn't have any idea of what I was going to find when I got there. It was... Uh, I was with a couple of friends and we'd, we'd um, <clears throat> been intending to go to a place called Cottonwood Cove. Um, uh, in fact, we'd been intending to go to Coyote Buttes, but we couldn't get in because we couldn't get the, um, the permits for that day. So we, so we booked to go to Cottonwood Cove and we saw that there was this abandoned farm called Poverty Flats and we thought we'd go and have a look. And it's just a, a piece of fencing in um, the edge of a, an abandoned corral next to a barn um, and as soon as I saw it I, I just thought fantastic I loved the, the colour contrast the the blue in the background um, this area here control thing there we go um, this blue is actually um, neutral coloured sand um, just but lit just by the um, blue sky overhead so it's, it's kind of borrowed light from from the from the blue sky, um, and I, you wouldn't have seen that at the time period as as blue. No, it would have it would have looked much more neutral um, when I was there. But I realised that it was going to go blue. Yeah. Um, the the foreground is 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 bounced light off sunlit sand, so that's why the foreground is much more neutral because yeah. it's it's direct sunlight bounced onto it, and then the background is 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 reasonably underexposed because it's in the shade and it's only lit by the sky. So there's yeah. a couple of stops difference. And I, and I was aware, very aware, that I was going to get that that blue in there, and, and because of the um, the colour contrast here on the edge, um, with this the resin colour that has turned yellow in the wood, I just thought that's, that's you know it's going to work really well. Yeah. Um, it was one of those um, images where you 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 see the possibility for it pretty much straight away. Yeah, um, it does have a, a three dimensionality to it. That crack this, with the well, I'm never sure about the the red and blue receding and coming forward, but it does in this example. It it, it really does look like a three dimensional edge. Yeah, around the crack. Yeah, and I think well, I think it's important that uh, that that it's actually quite shallow depth of field as well. I mean, it is actually would have been impossible to get it sharp all the way through. But yeah. the um, the negative space in the picture is as important as the as the positive space. So so what's not described, the outer focus section, is as important as the as as the section that is. You know, in described in great detail by the, the sharp rendering of the um, of the the knot, um, and I think what's important there um, also is is that it appears to be quite a straightforward picture, but it required quite a lot of movements to do it. The the piece of wood is is leaning at an angle towards the camera, yeah. And in order to get the blue, I had to point point the camera down through the hole in the knot, yeah. Um, if I just Put the camera parallel and point it straight through. I would have got a whole load of other rubbish in the background. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it required a lot of movement to work, even though it doesn't look like much was used. Um, oh, I've gone on one for some reason there. Um, so I think it's quite indicative in a, in a couple of ways of the kind of images that I like making. Um, it's it's not apparent that that work has taken place, but it was important that it was. You know that I used a large format camera. It's also it's it's a, somewhere that I the kind of place that I like to call an anonymous places. So it's not a well known viewpoint. It's not some yeah. fantastic um, sweeping landscape that lots of people know. It's just about finding something. Really walking around with your eyes open. Um, I think Bernice Abbott said something about um, 
if you if you expect something, if you look, you know look with expectation, then you will make an expected photograph. It, it's about travelling somewhere and, and and keeping your mind open to possibilities and really yeah. looking and investigating. So we we parked the the vehicle that we had um, near near to the farm and just wandered around for oh an hour or two something like that. I found this actually within about twenty minutes or so of of getting there. So is that really obvious that you've seen that? straight away as, a, as what was going to happen. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. 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 I, I, I could visualise what was going to happen. Um, I could visualise that I was going to get that colour contrast. Yeah. Um, it, when, I, when I got it back and I processed it, it the, the contrast was probably um, more um, powerful than I thought it was going to be at the time. Yeah. Um, because it, it just, because of the exposure differential, I mean, it really is underexposed, the blue in the background. Very, very deep blue. Yeah, yeah and, and that's really crucial, I think, to, to, to the way it works. Um, but this, this is a symptom of using, well, it's using film, but it's also using a static colour temperature. Yes. Because yeah. if, you, if you were using, I mean, it may work with a dynamic colour temperature where, where you're doing auto white balance on here because you've got a balance of oranges and uh, warm colours and cool colours. Yeah. But you wouldn't know the result if you use, a, if you, use you use film, but if you also use a static colour temperature on a digital camera, you can start to get used to the colours that... Well, I'll, I, whenever I do use a, um, a digital camera, and I, and I you know, I, I carry something like the little Panasonic that I've got here, I carry something like that with me yeah. all the time. Um, when I'm out and about with a 5.4, um, I always leave it on on daylight balance. I don't I don't ever use auto white balance. Um, yeah. because it's very easy to not be aware of, of the possibility for colour contrast because human vision is itself so corrective. I mean you asked yeah. me whether I could actually see that blue and that's a really difficult question to answer because because I know it's going to be there, but do I actually see it or yeah. am I am I imagining it? Um, and that's about training yourself to to look at stuff and also the getting the feedback from having the piece of film. I've seen when I've read a book on colour before, they, they use a, um, I can't remember what they call it now, it's a nigrometer, but it's basically a, a cardboard like a kitchen roll yeah. tube. And if you hold that to your eye and look at something, yeah. you lose all the auto white balance of your yeah, eye. Yeah, I, I make a tube quite often with my hands. Right. Like that. So, so before I've before I'm got my head underneath the dark cloth, I mean, when you've got your head under, under the dark cloth, you see the colours more strongly yeah. because you are excluding all of that other colour information. So it's got nothing to compensate. But right? you, can, you can just make a tube with your hands and, and look into the shadow and see what colour the light is. Yeah. Um, Generally speaking, if you've got blue sky day and you're working in the shade, and especially in places like this in desert regions, you're going to get quite a strong Is blue. Is that a lot more intense blue in those conditions as well? It seems to be, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I suspect it would also increase with um, altitude as well, yeah. because the sky gets a darker blue. Yeah. Um, but the, I think the reason it's more intense in the desert generally is that there's less scatter. You, you haven't got the haze to scatter the light, so... Yes, in the UK, when you've clear got, air. you don't often get really clear blue sky days in the UK. There's usually some haze yeah. to scatter it. Um, if you, in winter, with a northerly wind, you can get really strong blue light, but it doesn't happen anywhere near as often as it does in places like this. Um, and do you look for that occasionally? I mean, have you got that as some as a as a piece of information in the back of your head that that, that it, it, you can play with colour with it because yeah. you know those blues will appear. Yeah, well, I, I, I just like playing with the colour of light because we're, we're all very aware that, that the light shifts, but normally we only see it at the beginning and the end of the day. So the golden hour, yes. um, you know, we're, it's very obvious that the light has shifted um, and that we, we because the, the spectrum is quite reduced at that point. Human vision, um, Edwin Land, the inventor of the Polaroid, came up with this theory called colour constancy, and he realised that human vision is relative. We see colours in relation to other colours, yeah. um, which is why when you're in a room with a tungsten light, a piece of white paper still looks white, even though it's really yellow. Yeah. Um, and we are so good, our eyesight is so adaptive, that, that more often than not, we can't see the colours. So you train yourself to see the colour, you, you get used to seeing the colour, and, and you get the feedback because you get the piece of film and you see see what's happened. And, and I do really like working with a fixed palette, a limited palette, because you, you get used to what it will render. 
So you, you've got used to what Velvia does in terms of how it translates colour. Yes, yeah, and and it's and I and I kind of I think I use Velvia probably in a different way from how most people think of Velvia. I I I, I think it's absolutely at its best in the shade. Yeah, and and I don't like using it for for wider landscapes quite often because I think the saturation is too high and some of the, I mean especially actually Velvia too the latest one is is quite weird when you've got. Um, beginning of the end or the end of the daylight, um, it, its subtlety is lost completely. The Everything goes to red or red or yeah, orange, yeah. yeah, and you lose lots of other colours. Um, but I think if you're working in the shade, you you get a fantastic quality of light with it, and it just just lifts the saturation enough so that it um, gives it a bit more intensity. But it doesn't look unreal, whereas in a wider vista, it can yeah. look unreal. I mean, somebody like um, Joe is very skillful with um with controlling that but if you look at some of the more more extreme versions that you'll see um certain photographers in the states where they really like the kind of over the top technicolor i'm not yeah. not interested in that um it's, but it's I am about amplifying in, subtle color isn't it yeah I, I like to just tweak subtle color and i don't see that there's any problem with a bit of saturation artists throughout history have liked strong colors and, 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 I, and I don't see why in some way, because it's a photograph, you're not supposed to use strong colours. There seems to be a kind of, it's got to look drab, or, or I don't see colours like that. Well, a lot of the time people don't see colours like that because they don't really look at yeah. what the colours are. I've had that a lot of comments. People will see stuff and, and they say, oh, no, it's not, it's not that colour. You've played with it. And, well, no, I haven't. Actually, that's what it is, but your eyes normally... Well, we've talked, about, we've talked about this before. There's a presumption of colour. People translate colours translate colours into into language and say what they see. Yeah. They they may see the colour but they, they look at it and go, I know that I know that colour should be orange. Yeah. So they that's what they remember and that's what gets stored in the in their head. Yeah, I think there is a, there's a great deal of that, yeah. And and well people do that all the time anyway. People generally see what they expect to see mm. and not actually what's in front of them. Um and I, in that um I mentioned it in the last article I did on the on the issue twenty nine and I talked about how we should look till we actually see what's in front of us. And, and one of the comments was from a guy was that, that you know, um, surely we should, we should also use our imaginations. And the point I was trying to make was that um, it's only once you really see what's there that you can start to play with it with your imagination. And yes. so if you, if you leave the camera on auto white balance, you're cutting out a whole load of possibilities. People say, oh, well, you shot raw, you can change the color balance afterwards. Yes, you can, but if you don't know or you don't realise that the possibility is there, because you don't know actually what, what the colour contrast is, yeah. the inherent colour contrast, people just look at it and they think, well, that's how I saw it, that must be right. Well, there isn't any right, really. No. In some ways, this is right and what we see is wrong. Well, I mean, that's a classic case. You can take two people, one person just walking out of a lit, a lit room, one person working, walking in from daylight, yeah. look at the same picture and they'll see two completely different colours. Yeah. Because there's, there's a, a moment, an inertia yeah. of this colour constancy. It doesn't adjust immediately. No, it takes a while for, for you to do it. I mean, I think, generally speaking, vision is incredibly complicated. We take it for granted and we, and we don't notice what's going on most of the time. We, think, we think it works like a camera. Well, we think it's transparent, don't we? We think yeah. it, it, is, it just kind of flows. Yeah. And, and we don't realise, actually, that the assumptions that go on and also the patterns that we have built for how vision works. There are, there, there are a lot of things about the way vision works which are about assumptions that we assume that the world isn't trying to play tricks with us. Yeah. So when the world does play tricks with us, we get lost. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, that, and that's one of the things that I like to investigate. You know, when I show this image in slideshows or, or in talks and, um, and you ask people what the blue is, yeah. They invariably say sky or water or yeah. nobody ever guesses sand. They're thinking about something that must be blue. Yeah. 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 Oh, it must be blue sand then if you say it's, <laughs> if it's sand. <laughs> yeah. And you say, no, it's, it's, it's grey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, the, a very memorable day all round. I mean, I, I think I only made that one picture that day. And, you know, that's, that's fine. I'm happy with the one picture. Just afterwards, we got stuck in soft sand and uh, and I managed to the three of us my fr two friends and I managed to dig ourselves out and we drove on towards Cottonwood Cove um, and then we got stuck again in soft sand and and it was at um, 
it was actually on the first time we got sort of stuck that we realised that what we thought was a 4x4 wasn't actually a 4x4. Ah. Um, it only had front-wheel drive, because um, when you're digging around underneath, you realise that... Nothing's happening. No, no drive shafts. Yeah. Um, so we drove on a bit further. I don't know why at that point we didn't think perhaps we ought to cut our losses and turn back. But we, we were only about a mile and a half away from it, I think, at Poverty Flats. So we thought, oh, it's going to be easy. So we got stuck again, and, and we just couldn't shift the vehicle at all. And it was about, um, we spent about an hour and a bit trying to get it out. Um, and I looked at the map and I knew that where we were, that if we walked to Coyote Buttes North, um, that there would be people there because they'd sold every single permit. Yeah. And it was about 10 miles cross country. But if we walked out along the road, it was going to be 25 miles. Yeah. And you might not see somebody. Yeah. So I thought, well, we'll, we'll walk there, you know. <laughs> In the middle of the desert. Well, it wasn't, yeah, it well, was the middle ish, of the desert, but it was, it was 70-ish, so it wasn't, no, it, okay. wasn't, it wasn't too hot. Um, but it was quite a trek, because nobody walks, there's no path, because yeah. nobody goes between south and north. Yeah. So it's just... And nobody walks anyway. Trailblazing across, across there, and we got to a um, famous place, The Wave, um, just as it was getting dark, and we met two people who were leaving, Yeah. Um, and we walked out with them, uh, and it was quite funny on the way back out. We we um, we get to this sand hill, and they were really tired. This guy, he had a whole load of thirty-five mil gear and medium format gear, and he'd never walked very far. You said nobody walked him, and he hadn't. He'd never walked far with his gear before. And you get this half mile long hill, soft sand, and it's quite hard going. Yeah. So we'd walked eight miles or something at that stage with um we took all our gear with us I, mean, I don't know what we were thinking but we thought oh there'll be plenty of time to photograph yes <laughs> so but it took us yeah it took us four hours to walk seven miles or something so, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you'd it, think it'd take less than that yeah but it's it's quite hard going not not just because it's soft and you lose a lot of energy and um so we all took their gear and we walked up this hill carrying their gear <laughs> with our own gear as well <laughs> Because we knew that they were going to give us a lift back to Page, which is about 50 miles away. Yes. <laughs> so we were happy about that. Um, but we then, had, we then had the issue of what we were going to do about the hire car. Because when you flip down the visor on the, on the, on the hire car, the sun visor, it says, under no circumstances must you take this vehicle off road. <laughs> so, <laughs> that precludes a lot of stuff out there, doesn't it? It does, right? yeah. yeah. And we, um, we, we thought we'd come up with a story, which was that we were going to tell the hire company that we'd been abducted by aliens, because 60% of Americans have. They believe in it. Yeah, so they're going to believe that. <laughs> oh, sure, that's covered on the insurance. No, probably not. Probably not. Um, but I, I think that what's interesting also for me for this picture is that it's uh, one of those pictures that I still really love, even though it's now four or five years old. It does very, happen very often with your own pictures, because I know a lot of people tire of their more successful pictures or more recognised pictures. Yeah, I, don't, I think it's not a... Yeah, I mean, and you hear artists saying that they don't want to sing old songs, don't you? Yes. That they don't, they don't like it because they're kind of bored with it. Um, I, think, I think it lives on for me because it was so successful in terms of my aims for the photograph yeah um, and also it taught me something I think it taught me something about negative space which perhaps I hadn't really fully understood before because f most photographers landscape photographers they concentrate on the positive space they concentrate on what is described the things yeah the yeah. things uh, in fact if you look at somebody like Andrew Nadolsky's work he uses negative space a lot he uses the sand in between the boulders yeah. as much as he uses the boulders yeah whereas most people would concentrate on the boulder and that becomes the object whereas in his photographs the sand is the object and the boulders are the are the are the borders they're just it. edges yes. yeah um, and although the the knot is very much the object in lots of ways the negative space is really important as well mm. so it taught me quite a lot about that and it also taught me a lot of think about um about color and about light um so it was an important picture in in it kind of sparked off a lot of other um, avenues for how I explored photography afterwards. Yeah, um, you look on it fondly. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Do I look? I suppose I probably do look at it more or less every day because it's my picture on Facebook. Isn't it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't tire of it. I don't look at it and think no, I'm bored with it, um, and especially not when 
you know, you get a chance to, to really look at it um, close. Yeah, that, that, what, one of the things I, I, I don't despair of about the internet, but it's, it's very difficult, and especially in smaller galleries, you don't see the images in the, the full life of them. You know, we see a lot of photographers on the internet. Yeah. And we go see the occasional exhibition. It's, on, it's only when somebody goes to an exhibition and has an ch- opportunity to print an image big that you get to wander around and truly get to know it. And I, th- I, I think that's one of the joys of a lot of images, is that depth. That you can get. Yeah, it's certainly one of the things of five four, isn't it? I think because five four present a kind of hyper reality mm. because you have this ability to focus in a single plane and see lots of details. Where if you actually were there in reality, you would have to keep shifting focus and, and yeah. scanning your eye around. So you you get a very different view of the space. I think when when you see a big print from a five four. I mean, I don't think. You know, it's not necessary for everything to be big by any means, but but it is a beguiling aspect of yeah of the five four. It does it does lend a certain style to the large format photographers occasionally as well. I think people people think about texture more in the large format thing. Yeah, well, I think yeah, I think there are definitely images that would not work if they didn't have that richness of yeah. detail and if they didn't have the focus, it's really important that, 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 the, that I get the focus all the way on this plane and that's not possible with a rigid body camera because the piece no. of wood is at an angle to the, to the camera. So if I'd shot that with a, a rigid body camera, I would have had a strip through the middle that yeah. was sharp and it would have been soft top and bottom. Or you would have stopped down and then the background wouldn't have been as abstract. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this allowed me to have, I can't remember, but I think maybe... F16 or something, so... Well, we, we, I mean, that's equivalent to F4, isn't it, on a 35mm camera, I think. Yeah, so I knew that I was going to get the front really sharp, but everything else was going to go out behind. And Conversely, I mean, it's been mentioned, I know I know, we get talked about, the web, the, the website gets talked out about being quite sort of large format film friendly. Um, yeah. Uh, or whichever approach. Um, but there are also negatives to large format in, the, in that it takes you a long time to get things set up and it, it does instill a certain, uh, if you're not careful, it can instill a pedestrian quality in the pictures because you, you, yeah. you can only take static objects. You can only, how, do you fight against I pre- that I, I, prefer, I prefer the term stillness. Stillness, <laughs> yeah. To pedestrian. Yes. <laughs> um, do I fight against it? Um, I mean, you compose, you don't compose with a camera, obviously, but you compose with a small camera. Yeah. And is that... Did, I, 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 I would do more stuff about movement with a small camera probably yeah. um, because it's just easier to do it. Certainly, you know, panning and stuff is just, well, yeah. it's not impossible. I have actually shot 5.4 handheld from a balloon once a long time ago, <laughs> but <laughs> when I had a, when I had a, um, uh, a Technica with the, the Linhoff anatomical grip um, yeah. and everything was at infinity, so you, yeah. you could get away with it. But um, uh, I, th- I, I think... There is definitely a, a quality about them. I, I, I think they could be. There is the potential for them to be pedestrian, but I think there's also um, the fantastic potential for them to be meditative, and that is to do with a stillness. That yeah. has to do with inviting somebody into a space where it's not kind of busy. It's not too. I, I, I quite like. Um, compositions not to be hugely dynamic I mean I do use diagonals but I quite often like presenting things in a very kind of straight in the centre of the frame so, way so you're not pushing people around the picture with the composition yeah um, I think because sometimes that can be spurious I mean sometimes that, that, that introduces a dynamism but actually it doesn't help the person the viewer to actually look at what you've you're presenting to them it becomes more about um, more about a description of space and less about saying, "Hey, hold on a minute, look at this! Isn't this amazing?" And, and I think that's one of the things that I really love about Five Four is it, it it gives you that that depth. And it also, if you present things in the most straightforward way, there is a quietness about it, and and there is a um, you know, it's like it's like a portrait in a way of that object, rather than it being 
images. I'm not saying it doesn't have impact. I think it has impact from the colour, but it's not. But that's a different. It's not approach. trying. To, it's not trying to impose something on you. Is that possibly it? Um, so there's bound to be some level of imposition, but what I try to do is to leave room for the viewer to bring some level of interpretation to the photograph. Okay. And I think that that's the most important thing that you can aspire to in lots of ways with a with a photograph. Photography almost drowns under the uh, um, the kind of flood of description that's there. Yeah. And you can't stop it doing that. You know, description is 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 absolutely the the, the kind of raison d'etre of photography. But what you can do is present an image in such a way that it still allows room for the viewer to to, to have some kind of level of interpretation. And I think that's what I try and do anyway. How's how is your? I know your photography has changed. You started off doing um, taking pictures more in the vista genre in the classical landscape landscape genre yeah and over a period of time it became uh, you started documenting not necessarily smaller aspects but more abstract parts of the landscape yeah um, can you see your photography changing still now and, it, and which, which way is it um, it's, well I hope it's still evolving because otherwise I might kind yeah. of, might as well give up but um, is it still changing? Yeah, I think it's still changing. I, I think there was a um, there was a kind of revelatory moment for me, probably in about 1999, when I made the first detail image that I really liked, um, and I realised that that was something that I would I would like to carry on investigating. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure at that stage that I could have articulated why. Yeah. I think I probably just thought because I. Um, because the the image was attractive. Which one was it? Um, it's a picture of some slate in um, North Wales. I think it's called uh, Abergenol in Green Slate or something. It's in right. Landscape Within. Yes. Um, um, so I think that was the point at which I kind of thought, yeah, no, this, this is interesting. I want to explore it. And then the more I explored it, the the more kind of avenues opened up, and the more possibility I realised for different inquiries and the less important in a way the subject was the more it was about how I was investigating how I saw whether that's about the colour of light or whether that's about a uh, description of a space so the more it became about how a photograph might to some degree change what was depicted um, yeah. now not always Kind of fundamentally, you know, in, in, in one sense, this this image is is you know just baldly descriptive, although the colour is yeah um, is different. Um, but I, but I think it's about kind of trying to leave room for interpretation. It's about exploring colour. It's about exploring perspective to some extent. Um, and the thing that I've realised is that there's, there's probably not very many opportunities in a year for you to make images that do that um, because the subjects don't come along that often. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a couple of things together. It's, it's subject coming along and it's also being in the right frame of mind. Because um, I think everybody has had that experience where they they go somewhere and they can see that it's a great place to be but they can't actually see anything to photograph. Yeah. But you go back a different day when you're in a different frame of mind and you can see images everywhere. How, how how do you get around that? Because I mean, you've been you've been leading tours, a lot of tours, uh, yeah, over the last um, decade, just over a hundred, yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, a lot of your pictures have been taken during those during those opportunities, or, or before or after them. Um, have you got any any techniques that you do to get yourself in the in the frame of mind to create pictures? Um, or do you just know that it just, it's not going to work sometimes? <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I think I've become a bit more sanguine about it. I think I used to get very frustrated if I wasn't in the right frame of mind. Yeah. I think I used to get quite upset about it, and and now I'm much more um, realizing of the fact that uh, I can't force it, and actually trying to force it is going to make it worse. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, when I gave a bit of uh, advice to to a mutual friend, Paul Arthur, yeah. um, many years ago on a on a uh, a 
workshop in Glencoe when he was everybody was we were in Glenetiv and everybody was making images and he was he was struggling to find something um, and and I told him to to go and um, to go and sit down for fifteen minutes and I think he was, thought I was probably giving him the brush <laughs> off and it was just just leave him alone yeah. <laughs> but I, so I said you know just go and sit down and, and absorb just look at what's going on around you and and see what you see. And he came back about 40 minutes or an hour later and, and he'd made a fantastic picture. And he said that that was one of the best bits of advice anybody's ever given to me. And, yeah. and, and so I think what I try and do is I try and be quiet somewhere. I try and, I try and listen to the place, visually listen to the place, rather, yeah. than, rather than thinking, I must make a picture. What is there? Yeah. Actually, the best thing to do is just to sit down and, and see what arises because by sitting down and being quiet you you're more likely to see things In interesting me and dav thomas have had this this the same thing happened to both of us quite a few times where we're out in the landscape can't find pictures and all of a sudden your phone goes or a text arrives or whatever yeah. and you look down at the phone and just go through the text and when you look up again after you've been looking down at the phone for a minute or two things appear right and even though you've been staring at exactly the same spot before the, the distraction of frame of mind. Yeah, yeah, and also, uh, I think you mustn't underestimate the fact that actually your your brain is working on it the whole time, subconsciously, even though you don't know that it is. So your conscious yeah. mind is, is doing whatever various processing it's doing, and you're kind of consciously struggling for a composition, but actually your subconscious is doing the lion's share of the work, I would yeah. suspect. And that's that's, it carries on doing that the whole time, so you're distracted doing something else and you think I wasn't thinking about photographs for a while, but you were, yeah. just subconsciously. I don't know if you had the same thing when you're under the dark cloth working on a picture and you come out from the dark cloth and look and you see another picture quite often. Yeah, yeah. You're quite often the opposite way from yeah, the way exactly. that you were looking. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, there, there were, I've made quite a lot of pictures like that over the years. and I'm trying to think of, a, of an example now, but I have had, certainly had that, that experience. Or... or um, I mean, one of the things that we I tend not to do with five four is I tend not to um, shoot towards a final dim image because it's a kind of an expensive way of working with yeah. five four. So I try and work out before I make a picture. I try and go through mentally go through the possibilities for a picture. But sometimes you 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 do make a picture and you think that oh, that's the best one, and then um, and then when the picture when you've shot it and you're putting it away, you think. God no, that's what I should have done, and yeah, I'll, I'll return and make the picture. Yeah, because you've emptied your head of, of everything you were doing. Should we move on to the next picture? Yeah. Um, this is a a shot made um, a place called Goldfield in Nevada. Um, it's a, a town that was the largest town in Nevada in the turn of the twentieth century. Um, uh, a gold mining town had a population, I think, at one stage of over fifty thousand people. It now has a population of somewhere under a hundred. Right. And a lot of the buildings have just been left; they've just been abandoned. They're, they're, there's just a few people living in houses, um, uh, and a lot of people. The, the property prices just completely crashed, and people just left. They just walked out. Yeah. Um, uh, and I spent a couple of. I'd, I'd driven through it um, a few years ago um, at the end of a tour. Um, Death Valley tour. Um, we we go. We've finished the tour in um, Reno, and then we have to take the vehicles back to Las Vegas, where you hire them from, and and you drive down this highway, which is pretty, for the most of the time, pretty boring. And then you come across um, two towns, uh, Tonopa and Goldfield, which are about equidistant from Vegas or. Or Reno. Um, Tonopa is still inhabited. It has hotels and it has um, a couple of really kind of very dodgy looking casinos and you know this is, there's some life left yeah. in it. And then you go onto Goldfield and Goldfield's just the weirdest place. It's very strange. There's it's on the, it's on the highway. It's right on the highway. It's the county seat. It's got the wow. court. It's got the sheriff's office. It's got the the school. So people are bussed in from 30 miles in every direction. That's strange. Because Tonopa is 25 miles away. Yeah. Everybody goes from Tonopa to, to Goldfield for school, yeah. all the kids. Um, but the whole place is just kind of slowly 
decaying. Yeah. And and the great thing about it is that for me as a photographer is that it's not it's not been turned into a theme park yet. Yes. Because there, there will come a stage, I suspect, that somebody will decide that they're going to renovate Goldfield. And freeze it. And freeze it, yeah. yeah. yeah we've got to preserve all of this amazing stuff. Yeah. And at the moment, it's still really real, is, is the only word I can kind of think of to describe it. Um, so this image is... Um, I was with a, a, a different couple of friends, and we were, we were driving around, um, and it's in the shade of a building... So it's got a lot of borrowed light again. It's got yeah. a lot of blue from the sky. Um, middle of the day, pretty much, I think. 11.30, midday, something like that. Um, and it's uh, corrugated plastic. Yeah, I, I struggled to look at that to work out what it was, because it, it, it looks organic. Yeah. And yet the edges aren't organic and etc. Et yeah, it's, well, there's lots of kind of discontinuities there, aren't there? I yeah. think there's the... Um, and and there's the there's the kind of contrast between the the blue area and the and the very textured wood, um, very different kinds of textures, um, and the way they kind of flow into each other is quite quite strange as well. Um, uh, and we were just driving down the street looking for stuff because the time before that I'd gone through it had been very kind of fleeting. Yeah. Um, and I came across this, I saw the side of this building, and I just thought, God, yeah, there's pictures there. I didn't know what. Yeah. And we stopped, and we, we I think I probably spent, it's about um, 50 foot, 60 foot of wall. And I probably walked up and down for about three quarters of an hour trying to find out which bit I was going to photograph. Because yeah. I knew I was going to photograph some of it, because I loved the colour of it. Was it all this, this blue it's, it, plastic cladding? It was mostly intact plastic cladding and then in places there were holes where you could see the structure yeah. of the building underneath i mean it just had been a wooden it's it's the road depot building it, so it, it had been uh early 20th century wooden structure and at some stage presumably it leaked so they put plastic Wrapped sheeting it. on the end yeah. but it's all um perished in the sunlight yes in the strong Hence desert the organic feel to it yeah in the strong desert light and that's bleached it in places and it's made it very brittle um there's, there's little bits of um, tar paper and things. Um, it's going to take a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's part of the ceiling, presumably. Yeah, right? so there, was, there would have been a, a membrane um, behind it. Um, but in, it, in a way, it doesn't matter what it is, does it? No. Well, it's, it's, it's that... It's that inability to instantly comprehend what it is that's the... That's the Leaving that room to the viewer. Mm. Yeah. Intriguing the viewer. Yes. So I think, I think people will get the wood quite quickly, but then what relationship has the wood got to this other space? Well, it's, it's also... It, it has, for me anyway, this, this topographical shape of almost unpeeling, revealing something. It's like, yeah. almost like a back of a bodice or a back of a dress or something that's... Splitting. Yeah, I, I, lo I loved the way it kind of flowed yeah. away. Um, that's what attracted me to making the picture. And that's probably, um, on the screen here, that's probably slightly bigger than one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Um, so it's about two-to-one, on, well, maybe three-to-one on the back of the camera. Yeah. Um, so it's um, shot on the 210 lens, um, which is probably my favourite lens. Uh, so that's equivalent to something like a 70 on a... On a DS, a full frame yeah. DSLR. Um, I like the, as in fact, the poverty flats. I think shot was on the two ten as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and I like the slightly compressed perspective and the fact that you you have much more control over what you include and exclude from the frame. Um, do you do you hunt around with pictures with the, the compact? Is that what you use to try and sketch your way to a picture, or do you just use a card finder or you just see things normally do that hand <laughs> yeah um i do sometimes use the use that but I, the lumix but or, or or whatever i have to have with me but I, I also find that i end up making a different kind of picture if i do that i think yeah um i think it's it's quite i find it quite hard to work in different formats in the same space I think there are there are different kind of mindsets, yeah. And and I and I, I think that if I'm going to make a five four, and I, f I found actually recently when I got the I got the a GF kit, 
I stopped doing 5.4 for a while, I was kind of really intrigued with playing with a GF. Yeah. And then I didn't do 5.4, and then I realised that, hold on a second, I'm missing out on all these pictures because I was just in a different space, in a different way of working. Do you um, think that comes from the mechanics of using the camera, not, not, not necessarily the fact it's digital or, or the, the size of it, it's just the, the, the feel of it and the way you use it and the way you, you walk around with a, with a, with a camera? Yeah, I, su I suspect it's a little bit like um, musical instruments, different musical instruments. You know, you you can play the same notes, but you play them in a different way yeah. on different instruments. So if you, uh, I don't know, and I, uh, it'll be interesting for somebody like Richard to to Charles to say whether he agreed with that or not. But yeah. but I think that you can, um, you know, say you pick brass instruments and they, and you can play similar notes, but they will sound very different, and you would play them in different ways. Yeah, a friend. Um, Mel Foster said that um, we were listening to a piece of music and, and she said, oh, I think he, he learnt music or he, he started playing on a, on a string instrument. Now he's playing a woodwind because the phrasing is different. Yeah. It's not the way that normally somebody would phrase a woodwind. So that's like the subtleties of seeing and using, being influenced by... Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 th I think that the process definitely influences the final image, um, you know, there's a, there's a ritual about using the 5.4 that, that brings you to making, well, stillness or pedestrian, whatever, yeah. <laughs> but brings you to making an image in a certain kind of way, I think. Um, but you used to shoot medium format. Yeah, I used, lot, to, yeah I used to shoot a lot of um, medium format for, well, for client photography, yeah, for yeah. people photography and for um, buildings and all sorts of location photography, not, not really for landscape. I've always really shot wider view stuff on 5.4 because I'm very aware of the um, depth of field limitations and focusing limitations that you have on medium format and sometimes I think medium format can be so frustrating. It's the worst of both worlds. Yeah the it worst, is because yeah. you've got fantastic quality yeah. but you also can see where it's not sharp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas you know, so I, I, when I started out um, everybody, when I was an assistant, everybody that I assisted had, had 5.4. They didn't use it all the time, but everybody that I assisted had a 5.4 sitting somewhere in the studio. And it was just natural to use one. It, it didn't feel like a big leap to you, use one. You did car photography for a while, didn't you? Was that, was that all shot on 5.4 as well? 10.8? 10.8. Yeah, I mean, I, was a, yeah, I assisted a car photographer probably 15% or 20% of the time when I was working as an assistant. Yeah. Um, most of the time I was working for a guy um, who was a... Um, Studio still life and food photographer, which was quite a lot. That was five four. Yeah. Um, what I think is amazing, looking back on it, is that absolutely none of them had any idea how the camera worked. Really, it no. was all suck it and see. It was all, oh, let's see what happens if I put a bit of tilt on, yeah. or what happens if I put a bit of swing on. N nobody had any fundamental understanding of the principles. Yeah. They actually, they, the one thing that they did understand was about bellows factor and and exposure. They would have to correct their exposure yeah. if they had to focus close. Um, but otherwise, it was it was. I, I suspect they'd all learnt from somebody who also had just had some working knowledge of the camera and not thought about the process. Yeah. So when we were it? shooting ten, ten, eight shots of cars, they just used to fo focus a third of the way along the car. Oh, so they didn't really use the movements a huge no. amount. No, no right. movements at all on ten eight. On 10.8. That's quite remarkable. So they used to stop down a hell of a lot, I imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, quite a lot of the lenses went down to uh, 128. Like or, process lenses. Also. Yeah. And they were, oh, they always had absolutely the best quality lenses. Yeah. And they, when was this? 1983, and they were getting paid £2,000 a day. So, yeah. Um, there was no, no skimping on, on gear. I was talking with a photographer who was bemoaning the fact that um, when they used to shoot film, people said, talked about the cost of it, but they used to get paid good rates for all the film usage as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that yeah. was like a bonus at the time. Cause well, you, you probably made 15% on top of your film bill. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and you didn't have to change your gear very often. Very true. You, had a, you bought a camera and you might buy a few lenses, but they probably lasted for for years, if not decades. Which is good, because we've got all those studios to thank for all the, the cheap gear that's on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, yeah, yeah. Um, so one yeah. of the things it did teach me, though, doing the, the car photography, was it taught me about the quality of light, because 
you are photographing a mirror basically in the yes. studio and and you almost none of it is lit with direct light the the light is bounced off what's called an infinity cove yeah um the only direct light we ever used was we'd use little spots with snoots on the on the trims, on the wheel trims, to yeah, make the get highlights. Yeah, get nice and shiny. So these infinity booths are that the big egg-shaped rooms, the big circular-shaped rooms. No, they're things. not. No, they're they're um, they're rectangular, but they've got curved. The walls curve into the floor, and then the the, the walls curve into the ceiling. So basically, don't have any edges. On them. And the yeah. back wall curves. Yeah. So yeah. It all it's all made out of plywood and painted white, and it all just curves in. Yeah. Um, and then you would. Um, you would photograph the car, you'd get it usually three quarters or whatever onto the camera and um, you'd have a number of stands with a huge great long roll of velvet and you'd yeah. put that along the stands and you would get a, a horizon line. Ah, so that's where the reflection came from, that's where the... Uh, yeah, and yeah. You, you light the cove, yeah. bounce light onto the cove behind it and you get this glow yes. that comes up above the horizon line and then you have a floating ceiling above the car which you bounce light off which puts... The line across the bonnet. Yeah, um, and the lots of tricks to. So very manipulative in terms of of, of just sublighting p- p- shapes of things, highlighting the shapes of. Oh yeah, different. really, very. You have to the. It would take probably an hour or two to get the horizon line right because you've got the shape of the car and yeah. you have to accommodate where this artificial horizon is according yeah. to where the line flows along the side of the car. Um, I mean, now they don't do that. I don't think probably at all. It's prob- I know a lot of car shots now are all CAD information. That they don't actually shoot the car. Yeah, the computer-generated graphics. From yeah, yeah. They, they'll shoot the location now. Yeah. And then they drop a CAD version of the car into it and they map yes. the location onto it. So they get a 360 picture that they use for the yeah. reflections. Yeah. I mean, very, very, very clever, very high-tech. Yeah. Um, we were much more low-tech than that. I remember... Um, well, there were a couple of occasions that stand out. One was we were photographing the Ford Scorpio when it had first been launched, and they wanted to show um, all the in-car entertainment variations. And brand-new Scorpio, off the line, guy turns up with an angle grinder, and we took the roof off. <laughs> so you could photograph into it. <laughs> so you could photograph from top in, in, yeah. into this car. And it was... There were... There were Photographic um, computer retouching programs, but they were very high end and they weren't used very much. Yeah. And actually, what we used to do was comps. So we would, we had um, the the radio cassette player hanging off bits of fishing line. Yeah. In space. Yeah. And then somebody with a one hair brush would have gone through and touched out the all the wires and things. All the wires afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I was amazed how much film was retouched when I saw it. Uh, there's some, there's quite a few interesting things on eBay about. It's on eBay on YouTube. Mm. About how they how they use just paint brushes to retouch modelling and, yeah. and car photography, just remove reflections off the whole yeah. side of a car and things. Oh, they were brilliant. They were the the retouchers were were geniuses. They were really clever, very skilled people. So um, what so what got you into landscape? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a weird thing. Is now the the food photographer that I was mentioning, I called Simon, and uh, I'd worked for him for about six months, seven months or something. And um, one day we were. We just finished the shoot, I think, and uh, he said, um, you, you don't want to be a food photographer, do you? And I said, no, not really. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you need to earn a living. Um, and he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd like, to be a, I'd like to be a landscape photographer, but there's no money in that, is there? How bright I was. Uh, <laughs> if only <laughs> I'd, I'd stuck to that. Um, and he, he happened to, he had a long-term friend, a guy who did Benson and Hedges adverts, in the days when they could do cigarette advertising, who shared a studio with Paul Wakefield. Yeah. So um, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll set up a meeting. Um, I'll, um, I'll arrange for you to go and spend a day with Paul. So I, I went and spent half a day or something looking yeah. at Paul's trannies and looking at the gear that he got and, and immediately went out to... Um, to Paul at Linhoff and Studio in Marchmont Street, as it was then, and, and ordered a, a Technica, because that's what Paul was using. Yeah. So, um, I don't quite know why I didn't have that ambition to do it straight out of college, um, because my dissertation at college was uh, um, 
history of American landscape photography from 1880 something to the present day. So I'd, yeah. I'd done all of that at college, you know, Ansel Adams and, and Western and the new topographics and Mybridge and all of that stuff was all stuff that I'd covered. But for some reason, I hadn't translated that into thinking, oh, yeah, I could shoot large format landscapes, couldn't I? It's just... Is that possibly because you saw the difference between the, the, the way American, the American street photography and the way the UK, Britain treats photography? I mean, especially landscape photography, it's, in America it is a part of the culture. Yeah. And it's part of the history of the country. Yeah, people like St Stieglitz established it as, um, as a, a very much a kind of mainstream accepted art form, whereas... Yeah. In the UK, um, landscape photography wasn't that. It was postcards. It was. Yeah. Um, we, we didn't have an Ansel Adams, did we? Over here. No, we didn't really. No, we didn't. Um, and well, not till much, much later, I think. I mean, when um, and were they equivalent? No, they don't, they don't think they were equivalent. But when people like Charlie Waite and um, there are a couple of New Zealand photographers, Dennis War and. I've forgotten who the other one was. Who they, they all kind of came out together in the mid seventies onwards, and yeah. they, they were producing mostly the. Uh, Charlie was doing a lot of books, but um, Dennis War was doing a lot of stuff for the Sunday Times magazine, and and they were very strong color landscape work. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the first time when I can remember looking at landscape photography from the UK and thinking that it was interesting. Yeah. Um, and the tradition of landscape photography very much had been monochrome yeah. um, from Adams onwards and through the new topographics in um, 74 or whenever it was, 75 um, colour wasn't thought of as being an appropriate medium I don't think yeah. um, it's too real too real yeah and, and, and that's one of the things that I try to, to do in a way is to try and get away from the reality a little bit yeah by abstracting. Um, it's an interesting question whether I am in fact a landscape photographer anymore. Yes. Actually, maybe I'm false pretenses being on. Hey, we're, we're talking about a quote from Kyriakos, which is taking photographs of or with. With instead of of, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. and yes, trying to kind of relate to that. I, I, I um, inadvertently stole that quote from him and, uh, but I, I think it really does kind of sum up what I try and do with my pictures I'm not I'm not making an image of a subject I'm trying to in some way bring something out of the subject to relate to the subject in yeah. the way that I I work um, Guy, Guy Tell had a very good quote around that as well in a recent article which was most photographers show you what you would have seen had you been standing next to them. Yeah. And photographers as artists show you what you wouldn't have seen. Even if you'd, you'd been, been standing next yeah. to them, yeah. No, I thought that was a fantastic quote. I really like that. Yeah. I, that was a real God I wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I thought that was brilliant. And, and it's true, I think. Um, you know, one of the most amazing things when you look at other people's work is to, is to look at something and think, you know, how did he see it? Yeah, especially when you get a group of ph photographers together in a location and you've seen the raw material. Yeah, yeah, mm. but it's it, it it's a wonderful, um, it's a revelatory experience, isn't it? And, mm. that, and that's really, that's a powerful thing, I think. Um, Should we move on to the yeah the last photograph? Yeah, this is, this is um, relatively recent. It was taken about a year ago. Um, being a landscape large format <laughs> photographer, I don't make huge number of images. So, <laughs> um, so for me, this is quite recent. Um, it's it was made in uh, in Namibia in a, an abandoned mining town, a place called Coleman's Cop. Um, uh, in lots of ways, it's not particularly large format. I suppose. I mean, you certainly could have made this on a on a on a smaller format camera. Um, I just liked, I liked the colour, I liked the kind of limited palette with the with the strong splash of red. Yeah. Um, I liked the movement. It was it was actually not a particularly windy day. So um, when I first uh, did my meter readings, I I ended up with a, I think a quarter of a second exposure or something, and I realised that I was going to have to have 
longer than that, four seconds or yeah. something. So I put NDs. I, d I didn't have any overall NDs, so I shot it on the 150mm lens, which has quite a small front element. So you can get a couple of grads over it. So I put a couple of grads all the way down yeah. to give myself, I think, four stops of ND, I think, yeah. to get myself a longer exposure. Um, it had been left, I don't know, by a previous tourist, I suppose. Or somebody, or they, they'd left it on the ground and somebody it hung does, it. It doesn't look like something a, a Coleman Scott miner would have wore. No, I'm mining sure, a tie. no, it's a, it's a 21st century yeah. piece of fashion, I guess. But um, it's, you know, there's, there's a kind of, there's an amount of iconography in it because there's skulls on it. Yeah. There's, a, there's a kind of slight intrigue about what it's doing there. And, and the blank window, I think, is... Is, is indicative. Yes, yeah, so we can go in. It's it's hardboard, isn't it? You're showing me. Yeah, it's um boarded up because the building is slowly being filled with sand. Is that to try and stop the sand getting into the building? Yeah. Presumably? Um, so they've they boarded the window up with hardboard. Um, I did love the light coming in above it though, with the glow. Yeah, that's um, there's a little gap at the top. Yeah. Um, where it's coming in. It's, it's interesting texture, but it, I think it, I think the fact that it is blank hmm. is is one of the intriguing things about it. Why why is it kind of a blank window? And, and it's a blank window, but not in a really dark room. Yeah, you could is imagine it's open from the open doors it's open, elsewhere. It's or? open to to my right. There's a yeah. there's a double door to my right. So there's there's bounced light coming in from there. Um, is this, when, when you use a large format, do you experiment? I mean, how often do you take pictures where, where you just go, I'll try it? Yeah, reasonably regularly, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I think, I think that's, that's an important thing to do. Um, and and you, you also get surprises. That, I, mean, I, I was pretty confident I knew what this was going to yeah. work out like. Um, the colour on the previous one is probably not exactly as it was there because Velvy has done something slightly weird about yeah. it, but I, I'm perfectly happy with it because it's it's acceptable. Yeah, um, and you're not comparing like for like. Um, so there are sometimes there are color variations that you can't expect, but I will also try um, trying different um, focusing or trying different movements, extreme movements um, uh, where I've got a lot of swing or a lot of rise and fall. Yeah, there's an excellent excellent shot of some barbed wires sitting on a, um, a post of yours. Where you yeah. place the plane of focus along the the loop of barbed wire. Yeah, so the wreath of barbed wire yes. is actually sharp, and and the post isn't above and below it. Yeah, um, yeah, I like I like that's an interesting one when you show it to people because non photographers or even photographers that don't know about being able to manipulate the plane of focus get very confused by that. Yeah, because they look at it and they know there's something weird about it, but they can't quite figure out should what's we, weird about it. we bring that up on your on your website? Um, right. So this was the image that we were just talking about, where the um, the, the wreath of wire um, is all sharp. Um, so I've used compound movements here. I've tipped the plane of focus, and then I've rotated it by using swing. Yeah. Um, so that gives you a kind of slightly weird effect, where the um, the top of the post is out of focus, but the wire is sharp behind it, and the wire is sharp in front of it, which is which is quite a a kind of odd thing when we are used to vision working in a kind of parallel yes. way yeah. um, and that is one of the yeah that was very much an experimental shot I'd seen these this is in the Hebrides and I'd seen this quite often where the farmer has got to the end of the field and he, he's got a bit of wire left over and he just saves it for later yeah hangs it over the fence but it's also there's, there's also uh, um, potentially a sort of um, an iconography there because it's a bit like crown of thorns and yeah I'm, I'm very much a secular person rather than a religious person, but uh, but I can see, you know, that, it, that it, it borrows some power from that. Well, we have we have these sort of themes in our head and our subconscious, don't we? And even though we don't think, even though we don't think we're realising them when yeah. we see them, they still trigger things. I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that that was an experiment, and I and I and I quite I think it quite worked. Um, and it might be something that I try again at some stage. Um, it's it's difficult to know. It, it's very much dictated by by what subject I I end up with. Really talking about the future, you've got 
um, you started to do your own more of your own personal tours. Yeah. Um, what else? What else have we got happening in the future? You, there's, <laughs> there's a tour you're doing in Scotland in February. Yeah, I'm working with Eddie and Joe um, uh, at a place called Melon Charles. Um, a man called Adrian Hollister set up um, uh, a space there with. Uh, uh, workshop space with uh, a suite of Macs and printers and everything else yeah. and um, Eddie, Joe and I are, uh, are using that space to, to run a, a workshop called an Open Studio Workshop and the idea is to uh, kind of explore a lot of different approaches at once. So Jay will be talking, we'll take people out and uh, going through the process of how he walks through the landscape and how he makes images. Eddie will be talking about making books and making selections for exhibitions or for websites. Yep. Um, I'm going to be talking about the notion of slow photography, um, and, and you know, which is very much a 5-4 thing. It's about yep. kind of settling into the ritual. Um, we'll also have uh, my printer, David Wistons, there, who's a fantastic printer, um, and it, it, he'll be a, a great resource to have around. So people who come along will get a, a chance to um, really get to grips with how to print stuff. So. With all of those, with the three of us, with the four of us working there, I think that, that there's a there's real opportunity for people to spark lots of. So new they can ideas. sort of they can pick and choose the bits that they yeah. want to learn. Basically. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be kind of timetabled in it. It will have to be timetabled just because the logistics are moving around. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll allow people to pick modules on different days and to try things out. Yeah. And um, he's got this suite of Macs and he's got all the. the Software Lightroom and Photoshop and lots of other stuff. So, yeah. so people can do the image manipulation in the evenings when we come back in. Um, Eddie and Joe and I will help with critiquing images, and Eddie will help with picking sequences and working out arrangements for books and all that kind of stuff. So, I think it's it's a new, I think it's a f relatively new way of, yeah. of kind of approaching a workshop. Anyway, this um, is mid February, isn't it? Up in Torridon Way. Uh, yeah, thirteenth of Feb. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we're hoping for that to be a fixture, you know, that, that Adrian will invite us back again and we'll, we'll get to do it every year, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and in terms of your own work, have you got any ideas of, of, of another book or uh, exhibitions? Um, I'm, I'd like to do, I've got a couple of ideas for books and I'd, li I'd like to do some books. Um, exhibitions, I think, are probably off the cards at the minute just because they're hugely expensive. Yeah, they don't make a lot, a lot of money generally. No. And, and at the moment, people aren't, aren't really kind of um, buying images in a, in a great quantity, and it's right. a really expensive thing to set up. Um, books, I, prob I, I think I'd like to do, there's a couple of ideas that I've got which are going to be much more image-led rather than words-led. There, there will yeah. be essays, but they, they won't be as, as uh, and, and I'm sure that's a relief to many of my readers, <laughs> <laughs> that they'll be much less wordy. Um, and that, that's something that I, I want to do. Um, and the I'd also like to bring back Landscape Within, which now um, is out of print, and I'd like to probably release that as, as an e-book or, right. or, or a set of e-books. Um, possibly some extras in there. Yeah, I'd like to write a, a, another chapter. I, I kind of think of the books a bit like um, manifestos, and, and in that I, I write in as much as anything to be able to set in my own mind what I want to do. Yeah. So the, the images don't, that I, I put in the book originally don't necessarily fully reflect what I think the book is about. Yeah. So, that, so I, I think I would like to return to it and I'd like to review some of my thoughts and, um, and perhaps add, add some, up, some new, new kind of um, ideas as well um, and, and take it on from there. Brilliant. Well, so, okay. Sorry? Carry on. No, I was just going to say, I hope the dog isn't going to knock the tripod over. No, I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's been not too painful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheerio.